opening of the finale of York Bowen's first viola sonata. The viola player was Timothy Ridout and the pianist Franck Chupri. And that comes from Timothy's new Harmonium Mundi double album, A Lionel Tertis Celebration. I'm James Jolly and welcome to this Gramophone podcast. Timothy Ridout won last year's concerto category at the Gramophone Classical Music Awards for Elgar's cello concerto transcribed for viola alongside the Bloch Suite for Viola and Orchestra. And this new release continues his exploration of the enormous role that Lionel Tertis played in the history of the viola as player, teacher, arranger and champion of the instrument. So when you talk to a pianist about you know the greats of the past, the names they'll probably reach for, maybe Horowitz, Richter, I don't know, Kempf, Arrow, and on and on. Violinist, you know, probably Heifetz, I don't know, David Oistrakh. Viola players, I mean, who are the great names from the past who, who you yeah. would immediately reach for? I mean, I think Lionel Tertis has to be one of them. Also William Primrose, uh, Vadim Borisovsky, m- many others as well. But, but I think those the, the, those guys really come at the top of the list. And Tertis really is one of the, the forefathers of, of the viola, one of the really first people extremely active in commissioning works and performing a lot of solo repertoire for the instrument. And I think particularly in the 19th century, there wasn't so much of that happening, but there was a real exponential whoosh going on of, of solo viola activities at the beginning of the 20th century. And he was an important teacher as well as a, a performer. Yeah, even the very first ever viola professor at the Royal Academy of Music in London. In fact, there's a funny story about the, the, the Royal Academy from that time, because when Tertis was there, there was uh, no, no viola players, no, no viola students. And so they had the orchestra concerts, and according to Tertius's memoirs, they hired this uh, little old man who had come and play the viola. And Tertius said, could we not dispose of that man? And the principal, who was uh, Alexander Mackenzie at that time, said, no, he's a necessary evil. And so that was the state of... So they basically were prepared to have an orchestra with no violas. Basically, yeah. Yeah, it just really wasn't... Um, Truly yeah. extraordinary. Well, uh, at least when... according to these memoirs, maybe it was slightly exaggerated, but... Mm-hmm. Um, you just think, how do you grapple with the orchestral repertoire if you haven't exactly. got sort of basically the middle voice? Yeah, well, I think through the 19th century, there was this really this this thing that if you were a violin player and you couldn't make a career or, or you couldn't do what you wanted to, then maybe maybe give the viola a try. So it was really sort of shunned and um, sort of seen as a extra activity for violinists. But I think that really started to change. Then. And so what was what was special about Tertis's playing? I mean, there aren't many recordings. Yeah. There's a few from the late 20s. Yeah, exactly. There's So the first part of his career, he was born in 1876. First part of his career, recording really wasn't wasn't a, a big part of, of, of what a musician did at that time. So yeah, then we get these recordings, um, Vocalion and, and Columbia. And he's very, very lyrical playing. He was extremely virtuosic. There's this one really amazing recording of the Mozart Sinfonia Contratante where he added his own cadenza and it goes really right the way up the fingerboard. And I think that's something that hadn't happened in viola playing for quite a, a while then. But I think as well as the playing itself, he was just a real force of nature as a person and got so much done in his life for the instrument and for, for music as well. So what you've done for your album, which is a Lionel Tertis celebration, you've got works that were commissioned and or premiered by him. Yeah. You've got works that were transcribed by him. Yeah. You've got works that you transcribed as a kind of tribute to him. Yeah, kind of, or, or things that maybe he had also transcribed, but the transcription isn't necessarily uh, directly available. So they're all pieces that were very much in his life. I think maybe the only the only exception of a piece which he didn't premiere is the Rebecca Clark viola sonata. But she was a pupil. Exactly, she was a pupil. And before she went to perform it at the Wigmore Hall, I think around the time of the, that may have even been the London premiere in 1920 or so, she went to Tertis first to play it for him. So um, it's also a piece that's really linked to him. And, and I think all the viola players of that generation would have had Tertis as this big idol and, and, and role model in their lives. The album starts with the, the viola sonata by York Bowen, yeah. who, who's a composer that pianists have got to know, I don't know, in the last sort of maybe 15 years, because yeah. quite a lot of pianists have taken up the York Bowen piano music. Yeah, but less, piano music. it is beautiful, but less, less so the chamber music. But this yeah. is a gorgeous piece. This is a gorgeous sonata, yeah. There's, in fact, there's two of them. Um, there's another one which I've played and I hope at some point I'll get round to recording. But Tertis and Bowen, I think, had a very special relationship. 
Tertius spotted Bowen when Bowen was still a student at the Royal Academy of Music and he spotted him as an extremely talented pianist and composer and so they sort of formed a duo partner relationship and they toured with these sonatas actually also to Germany and Italy and at that time I think also international touring wasn't def definitely not the same as it is is now and as well as being an incredible pianist and composer York Bowen was an amateur French horn player and violist so he really had a great understanding of the instrument I think that really comes through in the sonatas they they so well encapsulate all of the characters whether it's the the sort of richness of the lower part of the instrument or the the lightness and and and, and delicacy of the the high parts of the viola because so. listening to it it's almost like a kind of you know the sort of the dying embers of of sort of 19th century romanticism I and mean, they're very much yeah. you know they don't look forward no particularly but they're very much of their time and actually beautiful totally, for it totally i think it's 1906 or, or 1907 and it's really I th I think this music for me sums up the best parts, um, at least in my imagination, of what Edwardian Britain might have been like. The the the, the good parts of it. The Just there's that sort of it. glow that you know, if you had yeah. to put a colour to it, it would be probably a kind of burnished, goldeny, bronzy colour. Exactly, and it's a whole just f a fantasy world of of romanticism. It's really late romanticism, which I I adore. And then you've got quite a lot of sort of transcriptions and, and shorter pieces. Yes. Presumably, you know, at that time, a lot of a lot of music what tended to be the shorter pieces, the sort of yeah. salon pieces, which we we've kind of neglected a bit now. Yeah, we have, and I think a recital program would so often include those pieces. But the thing that I find amazing to think about is that Tertz was born in eighteen seventy six, and yet I think of him as, in a way, a recent violist. Not not so long in the past, but when he was born, Brahms was still alive for another 20 years more or less and so all these composers that he was arranging or at least a good chunk of them were either alive or very recently still alive so these these beautiful shoppies Brahms, Mendelssohn, Schumann they were all really sort of fresh in, in, in everyone's minds and people just wanted to hear them and and I think Tertis wanted to show that they could be played extremely beautifully on the viola as well and that they weren't limited to their their, their original and of course Brahms images. was a, a great writer for the viola Yes, yeah. Well, there's the the, the sonatas, which was wonderful, which he he wrote for the clarinet, but straight away made a version for the viola, as, as well as the quintet and as well as the the trio as well. All of it was made in in versions for the viola, and and so I think the the sound world fits it's really well. So you've transcribed a few pieces, sort of, as it were, after Tertius. I mean, when you come to transcribe a piece for the viola, I yeah. mean, what are the what are the challenges? Because obviously it sits right, as it were, right in the centre of the keyboard. Yeah. So you know there is a risk, I assume, that you could get it could get kind of a bit murky. Yeah. You know, with everything going on at that, that place. That's the danger, and 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 also when you take it, it depends what you're transcribing from. That's the big question. If you're taking music from the clarinet, for example. You can more or less just play it exactly as it was. Occasionally, you might put things down the octave, but everything is playable in its original form. It's more a question of the affect that you get, because uh, the clarinet can sort of soar effortlessly in a higher register, where the viola might then sound more intense and passionate, and that might not be the right, right effect. Uh, whereas if you're transcribing from the violin, things go exactly down one fifth, and that's very easy. Or you play it a pitch. So, for example, the lever slides, which I have made this transcription of. I play in the original violin key and I play some of it in the original violin octave and some of it one octave lower. And I think that shows different voices and different registers of the viola. It's another question entirely transcribing from orchestral music to the viola, which some people have done. And the, the violist actually, Vadim Borozovsky, who we're not here today so much to talk about, but he made some great arrangements from orchestral music to the viola. And that's a uh, something I haven't really. Uh, that's an undertaking I've never. I've never done. Because in a way, this this album is a kind of well, it's not really a pendant because it's rather bigger. But I mean, it, it's a sort of supplement to your recording of the the Elgar Cello Concerto. Yeah. That you transcribed for the viola and won the Gramophone Award with. Yes. Yeah. Well, it carries on in a way di directly from that because Tertis was the first person to transcribe the Elgar Elgar Cello Concerto, and in fact, Elgar approved the arrangement. 
and they went on to perform it together with Elgar conducting and Ted's playing. And even when Elgar was was very elderly and not well, not able to conduct, he still would tune in on the wireless and listen to Tertius performing. And and there's you, we have copies of the letters where. And how how easy is the I mean, or how straightforward is the transcription? Because obviously the cello yeah. is an octave lower than the the viola. Exactly. Fifth lower than the violin. Whilst yeah. Whilst we're on yeah. Putting it in place, but. So so that's an, always an interesting question when you play cello repertoire, because you can play it exactly as is one octave higher but then sometimes you miss the lower register so for example for the elgar i took tertis's arrangement as my model and then i made some tweaks places where i felt it would serve the music better to to stay uh in the in the right sh shape the right pattern rather than suddenly splitting and dropping an octave somewhere yeah because that's always quite off-putting if you're listening to a transcription suddenly the melody sort of shoots up or down yeah it really can be and sometimes it's unavoidable and then there's the question of interpretation comes into it as well, because you can sometimes somehow mask it by putting the emphasis in a certain place. Uh, but sometimes you can't, <laughs> you can't, you can't sort of hide it. So it just takes a lot of trying things out, actually. And for example, in that record with the Elgar, we even recorded some things in two versions, a few places where I just really couldn't make up my mind. And then we left that to a question as uh, of, of post-production and... I was also guided for, for both that record and this this Tertis celebration record. I worked with Andrew Keener, who's a fantastic producer, and and uh, he's just guided me through everything really. So sometimes there is the possibility to 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 sort of try different versions, and and I find when I live with an arrangement that I've made or transcription that I've made, if I play it a lot in a concert or a series of concerts and then put it away for a year, and when I come back, I think. What on earth was I doing? I should have obviously done this, and then, and then I probably go back to re revert to the other thing that I did the next time. So I think they can sort of it's something you can you can live with, and I think in fact Tertius was was the same, rearranging things uh, through his life and tweaking things and writing new cadenzas, and and I think um, yeah, I think it's a way to live with music. Um, I mean, one of the the tracks on this on this album that is the most intriguing is the is that kind of almost a sort of fantasy on the Beethoven Moonlight Sonata. Yes. Which is, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, well, I think that probably Bowen scribbled that down quite quickly on a, on a piece of paper. It's not actually published, unfortunately, and the ending, the, the very last few bars are missing. So one has to decide what to do so i tried so the piece is basically it's it's basically the piano part the piano part is absolutely, absolutely untouched, yeah. untouched. It's, and it's... then over the top you kind yeah. of weave this yeah. sort of you know melismatic melody as it were yeah exactly he just he wrote this really beautiful obligato for, for the piece and it and it really changed it somehow but i hope it doesn't ruin it <laughs> i i find it extremely beautiful personally and i it obviously changes the the, the feeling of the piece but it has this kind of longing and, and yearning about it. It's kind of a reflection on the moonlight. Do you play it in concert? I have played it a couple of times in concert, yeah. Um, I bet it goes down really well, because yeah. people suddenly think, hang on, what is this? And... Yeah, it can be a really nice encore, actually, as well. Sometimes I've, I've done it when I've played a recital programme based around this sort of British repertoire or based around Tertis, then I think it's a kind of... Yeah, it's an, it, it puts people in a special mood when, when they leave the concert. Because it's a little bit like the, the Guno Ave Maria, yes, isn't it? Yeah, so I was actually just uh, <laughs> for thinking of that as well. Yeah, and I think that's something that people are much more open to, to doing these things. I mean, even actually uh, going back to, to, to another thing of York Bowen, the viola concerto, he wrote a fantastic big viola concerto in C minor, which is around half an hour of music. But he includes optional cuts, and it's it's something that seems unimaginable now but but in that time i think it was much more normal like leopold Hour, i think had some cuts for the tchaikovsky violin concerto and, and people had these ways to format the music for for the occasion mm. um and i think yeah also adding an obligato or or adding something wasn't seen as as, as, as ruining but rather sh showing sh showing respect and and admiration for the piece <laughs> Yeah. 
There's one of the other pieces on the on the album that has an interesting story is the Eric Coates piece with John Wilson yes, exactly. got involved in. Exactly, yeah. I mean that's a that's a brilliant story actually. So again, written for Lionel Curtis in the wartime, uh, I think nineteen forty two, off the top of my head. And Austin Coates, who's Eric Coates' son, was home in leave from active duty in the war. So Tertis was invited around to the house and they played through the piece, Tertis on the viola, and he had, he had actually sold his viola. That was one of his periods of retirement. He retired three times in his life and always came back. I think he found himself sitting at home and, and eager to do things. He went, they went and played the piece. It was absolutely beautiful. And then they had tea time together. And afterwards they played through it again because they'd enjoyed it so much. And Austin Coates distinctly remembers that the second note of the viola part was the resonant open C string of the Testore viola, which Eric Coates owned and Tertis was playing on that day. But because Tertis had retired from his concert activities, the publisher was worried that a viola version of the piece wouldn't sell. So they sort of chopped it around, made a violin version and put it up a fifth. And that also means change to the piano part. But John Wilson, who knows Austin Coates, was chatting about it and and about this gorgeous piece which is kind of forgotten in the viola repertoire and so John undertook a mission to sort of reconstruct it in F major with the right piano part with the right range and I think it's absolutely gorgeous unfortunately at the time of speaking it's not published in this in this version but I, I really hope that this F major version will be published um in the near future because I remember I remember John Wilson telling me about this story yeah. and, and, and how that it, almost a casual aside about the open string yeah. just kind of was like the sort of key to the whole thing yeah. you think ah oh, that's it so if we if we pin that second note to the open string yeah. everything else falls into place it totally does yeah and it's such beautiful music and uh, as well as that Coates was actually a viola student of Tertis so there's another really direct relationship you have various connections to Tertis. I mean, apart from the fact that you won the Tertis competition in 2016 and you were at the Royal Academy, so yes. that's yet another one. Yeah, Are I've there more? Often practised in the Lionel Tertis room. Yeah, well, in fact, another big one is that my teacher at the Royal Academy of Music, when I was an undergraduate student there, was Martin Altram. Who of was the Magini Quartet. Of the Magini Quartet, correct, yeah. And he was taught by John White, who was a student of Tertis. And, in fact, one of the main biographers of Tertis as well. So he was extremely close to... To Lionel Curtis, and so he was my, I don't know, you might say my great grand teacher or something. Yes, there's a direct, direct link there. As well. um, and what about the instrument you play on this, on this album? So the instrument I play on this, on this album is the same viola I've been playing for the last, must be seven years now, and it's a viola by Peregrino di Zanetto, who was one of the first makers of violas. So this viola was built around 1565 to 75. It's a very old. Very, very old, yeah. I haven't played an older viola than this, and you don't really even see them in museums. So it's an ancient viola, which I was really lucky to come across in J&A Beer in London. And it's been on loan to me, firstly through them, and then through an anonymous, very generous uh, sponsor who, who lends me the viola now, and that's organised through the Beers Violin Society. But it's a very special viola. It's quite a large viola. Tertis actually also plays quite a large viola, and I think there's something to be said for the sonority of a C string that you can find with a larger instrument. For viola players we always have this kind of struggle to choose something that's more comfortable and more practical, particularly with playing more virtuosic repertoire, or choosing something that's more sonorous even if it's a bit more of a struggle. And so I never thought I'd play a viola of this size. This is for the viola players listening or viola enthusiasts. It's 17 and 3 eighths inches the back length and the standard viola might be more around 16 to 16 and a half inch back length. So it's really on the larger side, but I think it's totally worth it for, for particularly for the C string. And uh, yeah, I'm very lucky to play on this beautiful, very early Italian viola. Now the album ends with the Rebecca Clark uh, viola sonata, which has become a kind of, it's sort of almost become a sort of standard work. I mean, there are gazillions of recordings of it now. Yeah, it's become really popular. I think it was more or less forgotten until the 80s or so. But yeah, it's a gorgeous piece. And and it's much more forward sounding, you know. Yeah. This is very much a 20th century work. Yes, totally. Well, I think Bowen's influence is, there's around... 12 or 13 years between these two sonatas. She wrote her sonata in 1919, but I think she had a lot more influences from French music and, and the, the whole impressionistic world, and, and you hear that in, in various guises through, through her music. Whereas 
I feel, I feel like Bowen looks more to the Germanic tradition somehow. And what can you tell about her as a viola player from the way she writes for the instrument? She also writes really well for the instrument. She obviously understood it really well. But c- compared to Bowen, it's really interesting because she goes for a totally different concept of sound. And I think even things like Portamento, it encourages you to play in a really different way. I think so, some people talk about a high fits shift or a Chrysler shift and this that you slide with the old finger or the new finger. And for example, I think in Clark's music, it often leans much more towards sliding with the new finger. And it, it has a very special, um, I mean, that's just one tiny example of, of, of the style of, of, uh, of playing it, but this, this sort of shimmering sound world. And it's also very fantasy-like, uh, I think, which and Bowen and, and Clark share that these two great sonatas but it's just different different worlds and i think she was also very inspired by ideas of the sound world of the of the far east and and i think she actually also traveled a lot she was half american and she lived in the states at one period now what we haven't talked about yet is is this album is unusual in that you've got two pianists yes how do i mean how did that happen was this were these two albums that suddenly decided to fuse into one in a sense yes i mean in, in a sense, there, there are two albums that, that became one, but they're, they're both intrinsically linked to, to Lionel Tertis. They're both really about Tertis. And so we decided to put it all together rather than stagger it and make two releases sort of a year apart or something. And its repertoire, for example, the York Bowen Sonata and some of the other pieces that I recorded with Frank Dupree, we had been playing together for, for several years already. For a German pianist, I mean, this must be almost entirely unknown territory. Yeah, it's true. And I think it, the first time I proposed it and put the music in front of him, I don't know, some six years ago, I don't think he knew quite what to make of it. But it's music then we really lived with, and I, we both... And he can play anything anyway. He can play anything, yeah. And he, he's recorded all across genres and, um, yeah, is a very, very gifted musician. And so I felt we, we really have to record this sonata together and then... That, that, that was the main point of this, but also the, the two Frank Bridge pieces we've also been playing together for some years. And again, Frank Bridge and Tertis were also very close. There's, uh, there's, there's a big, big connection there. I suppose that that disc goes a bit more in a Germanic uh, direction that we, we include Chrysler and we include the arrangements of Brahms and, and, and Schumann. And then the other disc, uh, which I record with James Bailey, who's also a really close friend and a wonderful collaborator of mine, we had worked a lot together, particularly through the pandemic period, on the Rebecca Clark sonata. And in fact, we filmed a documentary in several short parts together about the history of the viola, particularly in Britain. And of course, if you explore that subject, Tertis, sort of all roads lead back to Tertis somehow. And so during filming that documentary, we recorded a whole load of other British composers, including Bliss and Bax and Butterworth, uh, Imogen Holst. Delius. And so th- we had worked really intensely on this repertoire for a couple of years. And so I also felt that we really need to record this music together. And so it ended up in this slightly um, unconventional format to have a double disc with two different pianists. Is the style of their playing different? Because James is, you know, one of the finest song pianists yeah. in this country. Does he bring something slightly different to, say, Frank, who's a, you know, a fantastic jazz musician as well as chamber yeah. soloist concerto yeah to- totally they bring different things yeah and they're both such wonderful pianists and and such good friends and and also very different personalities as, as people which totally goes into the music making as well to try and pinpoint it in words is very difficult how they how they bring bring different things but um but yeah i think um and anyone who listens to, to both this will feel the, the the different ways in which they they, they, they lead the musical line and support the musical line and the, the touch. I mean, how, how they play as pianists, of course, is different attitude to the keyboard, but, but they both create such be- beautiful music and I feel lucky to have, have recorded with such great partners. <laughs> Part of the Vivace central movement of the Viola Sonata by Rebecca Clark. 
Our guest this week, Timothy Ridout, was joined there by James Bailier. And the double album, A Lionel Turtis Celebration, is out now from Harmonia Mundi. Gramophone podcasts are free, but if you enjoy them, then a really great way to support our work is to take out a subscription to Gramophone magazine. Over 13 issues a year, we bring you hundreds of reviews by our expert critics, as well as in-depth articles about the latest classical music releases and the most exciting musicians of the day. And if you head over to gramophone.co.uk slash subscribe and enter the code PODCAST20 in the checkout, you can even get a 20% discount off any subscription package. We really value your support. And consider leaving a review or rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And do look out for another Gramophone podcast very soon.